Copper is a greatly valued uh, commodity in the state of Oregon. A statesman, a physician, an avid fly fisherman who has already initiated the state's coho salmon plan. He will talk today about collaborative strategies to provide steelhead restoration. But first, and just before he takes a microphone to speak with you, Governor Kitzhaber, please meet Gary Benson and Dennis Vavrosky of the Association of Northwest Steelheaders, who will present you with an award. Gentlemen and Governor Kitzhaber. <clears throat> Governor, on behalf of the citizens or those citizens of the state of Oregon who really care about the natural resources of this state, particularly salmon and steelhead, the Association of Northwest Steelheaders proudly presents to you one of our limited edition art prints called Salila Falls by artist Dan Rickards. And to lessen the likelihood that this might end up at goodwill, we uh, put a little plaque on the bottom of it, and I'll have Dennis read that. <laughs> I read the bit the other guy. <laughs> Governor, the inscription reads, the Association of Northwest Steelheaders presents Oregon State Governor John Kitzhaber this award in appreciation for your outstanding leadership on natural resources issues, 1997. Now, Governor, congratulations again on this selection. On behalf of the Northwest Steelheaders, we want you to know that we hope and pray that your steelhead recovery plan works. And as always, you can count on our association for support. In fact, uh, after you get through tearing down the Savage Rapids Dam, we'll help you dismantle the Dalles Dam <laughs> so, that, so, that this scene, so that this scene can come back once again. Well, thank you very much. Uh, there's no chance of that going to goodwill. Uh, but I do have to say that uh, I uh, am very honored to accept that, uh, but I would like to uh, accept that on, on behalf of the literally thousands of Oregonians who are really uh, making this work. It's, it's one thing to come up with an idea. It's another thing to get thousands of people to change their land management practices and how they live their daily lives. And so uh, to uh, all those Oregonians who are going to make this a success, uh, uh, on their behalf, I, I thank you. Before I, uh, before I begin my, my formal remarks this morning, I would like to uh, take just a moment uh, and remember the name of Sergeant Richard uh, James Shooning uh, of the Oregon State Police who was killed yesterday uh, in the line of duty. Um, Sergeant Shooning was an explosives technician based in Salem. He was all, also a husband and a father and an active member of his community and, and a friend to, to many of us. Um, we'll take time later to, to celebrate his life, but for now I would simply like to call on all Oregonians to remember Sergeant Shooning, uh, like Sergeant James Rector and Trooper Scott Lyons who were killed uh, last month, that these individuals did give their lives uh, in our service. I'm going to exercise a little uh, prerogative here, and what I'm going to talk about is not steelhead recovery of Columbia River salmon, but the two are not um, unrelated. As most of you know, for the last 16 years, the people of the Northwest have spent $3 billion uh, in an effort that now employs 2,000 people and which has shown very few results. No, I'm not talking about the stealth bomber. Instead, it is our effort to restore threatened and endangered salmon runs to the Columbia River. Now, this effort that was started with very high hopes has foundered uh, on a fundamental lack of agreement. A lack of agreement on the objective of recovery, a lack of agreement on sound science, a lack of agreement on a common plan of action, and a lack of agreement on who is accountable for the expenditures. And it's not difficult to see how this lack of agreement arose. The Columbia River is our own answer to the Balkans. It is controlled in various ways by two nations, by four states, and by 13 sovereign tribes. But even with that backdrop and our record to date, I suggest to you this morning that we cannot give up on the salmon simply because our efforts to date 
have not provided them with much help. We must break through the futility of the last few years to come up with new approaches and new ideas for preserving salmon on the Columbia River. So today I want to tell you why I think that we have an opportunity to act on this issue now. And then I'd like to propose a way in which we can break this problem down into, some more ma into a more manageable framework. First, why I think we need to act now together as a region. If the Northwest does not propose a regional solution for salmon recovery, quite simply the issue will be decided for us. It will be decided by the Congress in its looming debate on energy deregulation. In Congress, if we don't present a four-state united front, the Bonneville Power Association, the BPA, our region's legacy of both affordable power and our principal source of funding for salmon recovery, will find itself in very uh, high jeopardy. So that's why I believe that when Congress takes up energy deregulation legislation next year, the Northwest must be ready by that time with a package that deals with the problems of Bonneville and the Columbia River. And that package has to include the following. First, a plan for how the BPA will sell its power in a competitive marketplace that is in keeping with the fact that it is a federal agency and not a private competitor. Second, legislation that will prevent the BPA from using its transmission system as a monopoly to keep competitors out of the Northwest energy market. Third, a cost control plan for Bonneville, including a mechanism for collecting those costs that Bonneville can't recover by selling power in the marketplace. Fourth, an agreement on how Columbia River fish recovery will be paid for into the future. And finally, a new decision-making structure for governing the Columbia River and planning what fish recovery actions must be taken. Now, that's no simple task. But inherent in everything that I say to you today is the assumption that we who live in the Northwest must find a new way to manage the Columbia River. Because make no mistake about it, the rest of this country does not have our interests at heart. Congress may well decide deregulation in a way that does not retain low-cost power in the region, that does not even retain control over power in the region, and does not recover fish. And I believe that this is the looming threat that can bring us together as a region. Because the alternative, one of losing the public benefits of BPA and losing a secure dedicated stream of funding for salmon recovery is not very attractive. And to me, it is not acceptable. So let me tell you why I think we can act now as a region. I believe that we have broadly shared interests in this region today. We share the desire for low cost power, we share the desire for water to irrigate the basin lands and to provide drinking water for our municipalities and to provide recreational opportunities for our citizens, and we share a desire to recover the fish. I'm joined by three other governors in this region that are willing and able to work together. In fact, in the last two years, I have met with uh, the governor of Washington, Montana, and Idaho no less than four times. In addition, we have a, a federal administration that will listen to us, and we have Indian tribes that are willing to sit down at the table and look for solutions. In June, as many of you know, I hosted a meeting here in Portland of the four governors, 10 of the 13 Columbia River Indian tribes, and representatives of the federal government, including Katie McGinty, who's the head of the White House Council on Environmental Quality, and Terry Garcia, who's the Assistant Secretary of Commerce. At this meeting, we started an unprecedented process of open dialogue and communication between the three sovereigns in the region. My goal is to keep control of Columbia River power generation in the Northwest and to keep power costs as low as possible. And at the same time, we need to lay out what the real costs of fish recovery are. And as a society, we need to make clear, responsible, and accountable decisions about the recovery of the Northwest salmon. We can get together as a region and we can propose a Northwest solution that addresses both power and fish or we can choose to cede the initiative and I think a significant part of our future to people outside the region. So it seems to me that now is clearly the time to act. We have a small window of opportunity. What should we do first? 
I propose that we as a region should adopt a plan of action that will deal with discrete and manageable portions of the problem. Specifically, I would like to discuss some ideas regarding harvest policies and hatchery practices, habitat restoration, and finally, the issue of river governance. First, let me address harvest practices and, and hatchery practices together. Because taken together, they reveal one of the real paradoxes on the Columbia River. The conflict between the Endangered Species Act and the federal government's responsibilities to honor tribal uh, treaties. Now, the tribes have harvest as one of their primary interests, and they are less concerned, in my experience, with whether they are harvesting natural native fish or hatchery fish than with ensuring that their treaty rights are, in fact, honored. But the Endangered Species Act, the standard under the ESA, is to restore a sustainable population of fish, which may not necessarily be a harvestable population of fish. And many of the things that increase the number of fish for harvest, hatcheries for instance, may actually be bad for recovering wild fish populations. So the problem results from two federal mandates, honoring treaty white rights on one hand and enforcing the Endangered Species Act on the other hand, which may in this instance be mutually exclusive. So the first step, it seems to me, in moving towards a consensus on hatchery policies and harvest restrictions is to resolve this paradox. So to do so, I propose appointing a staff level work group that includes the tribes and the four states and the federal government to develop some proposals to resolve this EA ESA uh, treaty rights conflict. Second, let me address the issue of habitat restoration. There is simply no reason that we can't develop a freshwater habitat plan that is similar to the Oregon salmon plan. In fact, with the steelhead uh, listings in the Northwest, and if Washington and Idaho adopt salmon plans of their own that are similar to and coordinated with the Oregon plan, we may, we, we may be well on our way. We already have a process to develop a recovery effort using the Oregon salmon plan as a model. What we need is a way to prioritize our habitat restoration work, both because of limited resources and also because the cost-benefit ratio, if you will, of the investment. That is, a given investment in some watersheds and in some stocks will yield a greater recovery return uh, than others. In 1995, Bill Bradbury, a, as you know, a former Oregon State Senator and now president of a group called For the Sake of the Salmon, put together a, I think, an under-proclaimed handbook on prioritizing watershed restoration to aid the recovery of native salmon. And in the preface, Bradbury writes, the challenge is to target all these expenditures to the most important efforts first. The opportunity is to actually make a difference for the salmon. Now, we can only do that if we pay attention to the biology, not the politics, not the agency turf, but rather prioritizing our efforts based on the biology of the salmon, which very quickly leads to the biology of healthy watersheds. And Bradbury is correct. The key here is watersheds. If we are able to restore watershed health in the Columbia River Basin, then we don't need to deal with each and every species with a separate recovery plan. One watershed plan could conceivably address all of the species. Furthermore, using the local watershed council approach that's at the heart of the coastal salmon plan, we get the kind of citizen ownership and involvement that is necessary to secure long-term success. Now finally, let me tackle perhaps the most contentious issue on the river, the one that we call river governance. Behind this simple name lies a very complicated problem involving a number of factors, including a Columbia River ecosystem that has been fundamentally altered by hydroelectric development, a lack of clear empirical science on which to base a recovery plan, the sheer number of economic stakeholders who are impacted by recovery strategies, including agriculture, recreation, aluminum smelters, barge companies, ports, utilities. And what's been going on for the last 15 years is each one of these stakeholders is an advocate for or against a particular recovery strategy, drawdowns or increased spill or dam removal or barging or hatcheries, based on how it will impact them economically. And that re the net result is that these competing economic interests have effectively blocked any serious discussion of a real solution to resolving the problems in the Columbia River. And then there's the need for consensus among 19 separate governmental entities, the United States, Canada, four states, and 13 sovereign tribes. 
There's the lack of coordination among seven federal and regional agencies, all of which have some jurisdiction over the Columbia River. And finally, there's the lack of accountability for how these restoration dollars are being spent. It seems to me that to deal with this complex issue of river governance, at least four steps are going to be required. First, as I said earlier, we must create a new forum of state, federal, and tribal representatives to decide Columbia River issues. Now, this forum could be a modification of the existing Northwest Regional Power Planning Council, or it could be a new entity. But in any event, it must include participation of the four states, of tribal interests, and of the federal government, and it must have real, real authority to make decisions that, about the allocation of resources and about the coordination of activities among all of these entities within the Columbia River Basin. Second, we must clearly identify the objective of the recovery plan. Now, that sounds fairly simple, but in fact, it has been quite elusive. To me, the objective has to be not only a sustainable population, but also a harvestable population, at least for the tribes, and preferably for our commercial and sports fishing industries as well. Third, we need to develop consensus on the science on which to base our recovery plan. I will seek agreement with my three colleague governors on the extent of scientific consensus and on the basis for developing additional needed scientific knowledge about salmon and about the Columbia River. With the recognition that this science is going to be evolving and that the plan has to be drawn in a way that it can be modified and updated based on new information as it comes in. Finally, I, we need to clearly identify the economic stakeholders and we need to acknowledge and validate their concerns and make the costs and politics of recovering the salmon explicit. We need to get the money on the table and we need to get the politics on the table. Now the economic stakeholders is this long list of interests that I just mentioned that drive recovery politics in the four states and in the region. And the fact is that we are not going to succeed in this challenge by belittling these economic interests on the river. Rather, we must address the concerns of the economic stakeholders in any proposed plan, and the costs of doing so have to be clearly identified and incorporated as a part of the recovery strategy. And I believe this point that I just made is the crux of the issue for the salmon, for our river, and for the Bonneville Power Administration. For too long, we have labored under the assumption that we can recover the salmon in the Columbia River without incurring political or economic costs. And the fact is that we can't. The bottom line is that an effective salmon recovery strategy based on sound science is going to cost everybody something. What we haven't done is figure out who and how much. And until we do that, we can't really make accountable decisions. And until we do that, we can't really know what salmon recovery will really cost us. And until we do that, we can't really make serious progress on saving salmon. While a recovery plan has to be based on sound science. There's no argument about that. The implementation of that plan is ultimately going to be based on practical politics that is going to be driven by economics. And it is time that we acknowledge that. In, in short, it is time that we get on with the work of saving salmon, not because people are telling us to, although they are, and not because it is a federal mandate, although it is, but because in our hearts we know that it is the right thing for us to do. To be in the Northwest, to my way of thinking, is in a visceral way to be connected with these marvelous creatures we call salmon. And whether your family has been here 10,000 years or just 10 days, I believe that Northwesterners identify salmon as the symbol of a healthy environment and as a symbol of our abundance as a region. And if we lose the wild salmon, we will believe be losing much, much more than the fish. It will be certain then that we are losing the battle to keep our watersheds healthy and that the salmon are just the first to go. And it will also be certain that we are failing in the challenge to reach across political and cultural boundaries to join in common cause. And we simply cannot permit this to happen. We cannot permit this to happen. So today I'm committing myself to make a difference for Columbia River salmon and I'm asking that each and every one of you make the same commitment. Eventually, it will require sacrifice, individually and regionally. But if shared, I believe that that load will be bearable. So the choice before us 
is very, very clear. Either we as a society choose to make the sacrifices or we choose to sacrifice the salmon. And I don't believe that we will choose the latter path. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. You, uh, we appreciate that you're using this pulpit to, to lead people, and it's uh, one of the many reasons why you have the respect that you do. Now, in this issue, there's, as you say, there's so many different groups that have an interest in it. Even looking out at the audience today, we can see representatives of the various organizations. Now, this issue has been around for a long time. Obviously, now, given the potential endangered uh, species status, it's a little more pressing. But you've obviously talked with your counterparts. You've said that you have about this issue. You've talked with, uh, with scientists. Uh, you've talked about the objectives. I'm wondering, uh, in establishing this council, whether you would open it by making a proposal, much like the, the perhaps you've, you've got the coho salmon plan. Would you open this council with a suggestion that this is what you think is the way the issue should be handled. This is how the different representatives should be placated. And this is a plan that we should adopt and then have it open to discussion. Or do you simply propose to form the council and see what happens? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, <clears throat> The, the process that we're going through, there's, there's, a, there's a number of steps. One of them is figuring out how you have a governance structure that has a participation of the three sovereigns that are affected. The Power Council doesn't directly involve the, the federal government, although they certainly are involved in it. It doesn't directly involve tribal representatives. So you need to have a governance structure that does that, but it has to have real authority here, and I think that may take some congressional, uh, some congressional action. So part of the package will be that we take back to Congress, hopefully, will deal not only with the energy deregulation issue and the BPA issues, but, but creating this forum. The second is agreement on the science, and I think the four people that have to agree on the science ultimately um, uh, are the four governors. Uh, and, and we have had um, four meetings in two years, as I said, that's unprecedented. Uh, and I think we all are fairly close to recognizing the Independent Science Advisory Board that's advising the uh, Northwest Regional Power Planning Council is as good a group of scientists as you're going to get. Um, so I, I, I think the answer is that we will create it, but obviously it's going to be a very open process as they make their deliberations. But they have to have the authority to act, not simply advise, or I think uh, uh, we're going to uh, not get out of the, uh, the gridlock that we're in. Hey, Tanson, member of the club. <clears throat> Governor, one uh, thing that the scientists are in agreement on is the lethal effect of the main stem dams on salmon migration. Uh, estimates range at the low end, even by Bonneville's own uh, Fish and Wildlife Agency, to 75% to uh, as high as 95% of all mortalities of salmon are caused by uh, directly or indirectly these dams. Uh, for that reason, for many years, the salmon advocates throughout the Northwest and the State Fish and Wildlife Agency in this state and all the Indian tribes have have advocated a drawdown of John Day Dam for the peak period of juvenile migration between beginning and mid-April. Uh, this has uh, been uh, a, uh, an effort that I think has drawn an enormous amount of support uh, from the scientific community and recognizing the economic impacts on the uh, agricultural irrigation community. There have been efforts made to uh, make sure that they're held harmless so that the cost of extending those irrigation pipes uh, will uh, essentially devolve upon the government. My question today is, this is still an open issue. There's probably no greater uh, action that uh, you could take or that the, uh, the Carmi Corps could take than to draw down that dam during the, the peak juvenile period, allow those salmon to migrate naturally. Would you support that? I would not support it uh, as a single action without a more uh, comprehensive plan on river governments to back it, governance to back it up. Uh, I think uh, when we get the plan, the plan that, that, that we act on has to be one that includes not only a consideration of that issue, I, obviously the issue of breaching is there, the issue of barging is a part of this. If you take all the dams out and don't do anything about salmon habitat, you haven't really recovered the salmon. And I think that the economic interests tend to focus uh, on one strategy uh, that, uh, con that, that concerns them from an economic standpoint, but I also think the environmental community tends to focus on one or two strategies as well. And we have to get beyond that and develop a comprehensive plan that looks at all the aspects of river governance in total. 
uh, and the science, I think we are very close to a point where the science is going to be able to dictate, uh, dictate those kinds of actions. Once we do that, however, we have to really quantify the economic impact. It's easy to say take a dam out or draw the John Day down, but then you have to say, well, are the ratepayers willing to accept an increase in the rates in the region? And what about, uh, you know, what about the barge companies? And you have to be able to get those, those, those politics up on the table. If you're going to talk about a, a specific strategy, you have to have the economics and the pol politics right up there beside it, not pointing fingers at someone who's a black hat because they oppose this or that, but saying, here's the cost, here's the price tag. Now, are we as a region willing to make those sacrifices together to make this happen? There isn't one entity or one sacrifice that can pull this off. We're in this together, and we have to approach it in a comprehensive fashion. My name is Leslie Hildula. I'm a City Club member and a third generation Oregonian. And I want to talk about economics, um, follow up on your talk comment. My great grandmother, Lena Kalunki, worked in the Astoria cannery. My grandfather, Art Hildula, harvested fish via horse drawn nets off the, the riverbanks in Klatskanai. And when I was a child, salmon in Klatskanai was so plentiful that we ate it as frequently as hamburger. Hasn't the salmon run? the wild salmon run, been, a, been in the past a huge source of jobs and can't, jobs and, and food source. Can't it be again for us? Well, the answer is yes, it was in the past, and uh, I think we all hope that it, that it can be in again, again. And I, I think the, uh, the, the issue uh, is uh, developing a, a, a process uh, by which you actually, I mean, you have to break this down into some component parts and look at each one of the parts, but you have to get the, poli as I said before, you, in order to do that, you've got to get the losers up, on, up there on the table as well. If the salmon in the Northwest are the winners, the losers have to be up there in the dialogue or nothing will happen. So the answer is I hope it'll happen and that's really what we're trying to do here today. Governor Kitzhopper, Jay Formick, City Club member. Um, the comprehensive review paid attention to this issue, but it was cursory. Furthermore, the comprehensive review results had nothing to say about uh, river governance, but the comprehensive review also paid attention to other issues, other public purposes that have to be figured into what, what you've discussed here as the deregulation of the electric industry, namely uh, energy assistance and weatherization programs for low-income people and uh, conservation issues. I'm wondering, in your view, how do these other public purposes fit into the convening you just told us about of the, of the <clears throat> sovereigns to start talking about river governance? Where do these other public purposes fit into that picture? You mean the uh, 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 conservation and uh, yes, yeah. and the, the 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 review actually dealt with uh, with with the, with uh, 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 low income uh, uh, issues and the, and the. Uh, uh, and conservation issues. That was an explicit part of the of the of the of their recommendations, and that will be included in in the consensus position that the governors developed to take back to Washington. We made a conscious choice not to do river governance as a part of that. Everyone acknowledged that you can't do power without doing fish, and you can't do fish without doing power. But the but the sheer enormity of getting a regional consensus on the energy side of this was enough that we felt if we could pull that off. Uh, we'd be lucky, and we did pull that off. And what we're doing now in the meeting we just had in Montana with the four governors last week has, has really been, all the discussion since then has been focused with implementing the, the recommendations of the regional view and then folding in uh, river governance. But you have to have them both together when you go back to D.C. Gary Benson, I'm also a city club member. Um, do you have any thoughts on dispute resolution on the river without relying on the courts? Well, I think any time you can avoid relying on the courts, it's a home run. Um, we, that, that is obviously a real big topic. Uh, in the, we have a process called the Three Sovereigns Process that I mentioned that started with the uh, meeting in June. Uh, and I think it, uh, when we decide and agree, and I believe we will, on the kind of forum we need, the real issue is what do you do and how do you resolve a gridlock? And there has to be some kind of dispute resolution process uh, incorporated into that to make this work. And, and I would prefer it not being I would prefer the dispute resolution process not involve the courts. I think the, the role of the courts, in my mind, is to make sure that the plan meets the, the requirements of the Endangered Species Act. That's a legitimate role for the courts, and the plan does have to meet that law. But I think in the, in the daily operations of this body, if they have to turn to the courts uh, to, resu to resolve disputes, then we're not going to make, make it over the top. Uh, Moraine Polanyi, a city club member, Governor. I want to see how you turn salmon into a transit issue. Well, That's what I want to say. <laughs> I have confidence that you can do it. 
you stole my thunder. I said, <laughs> I, I wasn't going to talk about salmon transportation. <laughs> and I won't. <laughs> but my question is this. You have been talking to the four governors. You have been talking to the federal government. But what about the Columbia River Compact with Canada? You have Alberta and British Columbia, which are heavily involved. The river is born in the mountains between the two provinces, flows into Canada for a long time. There is a river compact between the two uh, governments. Uh, without involvement of the Canadians, I think it's going to be a, a tough one. Uh, are you in conversation with them, with our premiers and so on? We, I have actually had some conversation, a couple of conversations with uh, Mr. Clark about this just before they uh, held up the ferry boat. Um, <clears throat> so I thought I'd maybe let that cool off. That is a transportation issue, by the way. Uh, um, your, your point's very well taken. I think there's a, an acknowledgement on the parts of, of uh, of the tribal representatives and, and the four governments that you can't leave Canada out of this formula and whether you do that through, I don't know, you know, obviously that is a different animal than dealing with the entities within the borders of the U.S., but that uh, we're very cognizant of the fact that you have to have them involved in this. Marie Morgan, City Club member. I applaud your comprehensive approach that acknowledges the fact that we are all interdependent. Um, I'm wondering if there are some specific probably bold actions that we should be taking concurrently with what you've talked about today for the Willamette watersheds? The, um, the answer is yes. Uh, I gave a talk about a week ago to the uh, Environmental Business Forum that the Oregon Environmental Council puts out, and that really was the topic. Uh, we are making, we have got a number of groups uh, working right now. One of them is the Willamette uh, Valley River Livability Forum, and one is the uh, uh, Willamette uh, uh, Basin Task Force that's essentially looking at the issues of the health of the Willamette River. And I think what, 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 what um, uh, the, the challenge is taking a, essentially an ur a rural model, which is what the uh, coastal salmon restoration effort is, and applying it to an urban environment. Uh, because the, the big, I mean, you've got, you've got a whole host of different entities polluting the Willamette River today, but the majority is probably coming from runoff. Uh, from you know uh, rooftops, parking lots, roads, and runoff is 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 really a function of how we all do thousands of little things in our daily lives, uh, and we uh, over the next couple months we'll be rolling out some specific uh, suggestions on on what uh, citizens can do to try to address that issue. It's going to be much more complicated, but I think. Um, you know, I think people in, in Portland probably think the environment, uh, many people in Portland, and certainly not this group, uh, think the uh, Endangered Species Act is something that impacts farmers and ranchers and people in rural Oregon. Well, uh, got news for you folks, it's coming to Portland, and uh, we need to be ready for it. David Wu, City Club member. Governor, given the life cycle of the salmon and the life cycle of governmental process, what's the... S <laughs> what? With well, term limits, it's almost the same. <laughs> well, what's the soonest that we might see some salmon recovery, given your most optimistic uh, time horizons? You know, I don't know that I'm qualified to answer that question, but it's, it's going to be a number of years. Uh, you know, we, one, of the, one of the big unknowns here, the, probably the big unknown here, is, is ocean conditions and the impact that has on, on salmon restoration. I do, I do think, though, that we, we um, there's two things that we can, we can do. This is, I can't answer your question, so I'll, <laughs> uh, and, and I don't know the number of years, but I think it's, it's down the road a bit. We do, however, have kind of an interesting um, uh, situation on the West Coast. We have the Oregon coastal salmon effort that, that the federal government is allowing us to try to implement recovery through a volunteer effort. We have the shared ESU down between the, the, the range between Southern Oregon and Northern California where there's been a listing and we're trying to recover that through what's called a 4D process. And down in California, we just have a listing. Uh, now, all of those, uh, all of those three uh, ranges have the same ocean. And one could argue that we've got a great test tube here uh, to see which technique will be most effective in actually producing results under the Endangered Species Act. So um, uh, there's good news. Snow, survival, value, and pessimism. My name is Peter Goodwin. I'm a city club member, unfortunately a first-generation Oregonian. <laughs> um, I'm going to take the liberty, if I may, of asking you a question about a different sort of environment, the environment of patient care. Um, there is a research panel of the city club that is going to report to the city club about its findings on ballot measure 51, which has to do with physician aid in dying or assisted suicide. 
And I was wondering whether I could presume upon you to ask you now how you feel about that process and about Ballot Measure 51. Certainly. Um, I oppose Ballot Measure 51. <clears throat> I don't believe that... Um, I don't believe that the, the statute should be repealed for a number of reasons. One, I think Oregonians have already spoken on this. Uh, there are some legitimate implementation issues. The legislature had an opportunity to address those. They chose not to address them. They didn't have the courage to repeal it. They sent it back to the voters. Uh, this is a topic, an issue that's not going to go away, regardless of what happens with Ballot Measure 51. Uh, as people live longer, as more chronic illnesses develop, uh, as a consequence of that, and as medical science becomes more expensive, this is an issue that is going to face us over and over again as a society, and we have to at least have a dialogue on it. The place to have that dialogue is in the Legislative Assembly, because what you will be treated to uh, in November is just what you were treated to a few years ago, which is a lot of emotional 30-second sound bites that don't illuminate any of the fundamental ethical or moral or economic questions about this. So I am hoping that it goes back to the legislature and that the legislature then has a good faith effort to try to implement it. Now maybe at the end of that you find out you can't. Well then we know. But at least we, unlike other states, have had an honest discussion about this issue and haven't just swept it under the carpet. So um, vote no on 51. <laughs> What an easy group. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you very much, Governor Kitzhaber, for your uh, vigor, your uh, enthusiasm, and particularly for your leadership on this uh, and on many other issues. Uh, the City Club would love to host uh, any of the gatherings of your fellow sovereigns uh, <laughs> uh, in this part uh, of the United States and hear from all of you further. And uh, certainly I want to know what you fished for in Montana. Uh, we thank you very much for coming today and we do stand adjourned. <clears throat>